lost and found. Thank you. Adam is greatly relieved. <clears throat> well, welcome everyone to uh, our Thursday Swarm Lab seminar. Got a great crowd today. I'm glad you were, those of you who are able to come early actually got food. Those of you who didn't, I hope you enjoy the salad. It's really good. Uh, <laughs> we are very, very pleased to have our visitor from Willow Garage, Leila Takayama. Greatly anticipated. We've been really anxious to have you come here. Thanks. And uh, very pleased. I'll give a, a brief uh, introduction. Layla is a research scientist and manager for human robot interaction at Willow Garage in, in Menlo Park, California. This year, she was named one of the Tech Review's 35 innovators under 35, a mere child, as well as one of the Fast Company's 100 most creative people in business. Congratulations. She completed her doctorate in communication at Stanford University. She also holds a PhD minor in psychology from Stanford, a master's in communication from Stanford, and a bachelor's degree in psychology and cognitive science from UC Berkeley. While at Cal, she got hooked on undergraduate research as part of the group for user interface research, GER, in EECS. <laughs> During her graduate studies, she was a research assistant in the user interface research group at the Palo Alto Research Center. Her research interests include embodied cognition and social and cognitive psychology of interacting with non-human agents. Her current focus is understanding human encounters with robots in terms of how they perceive, understand, and feel about it and interact with robots. So very, very timely and very appropriate talk for this warm up. Thank you for coming. All right, thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's, it's really good to be here. I know that some of you may or may not know what this place called Willow Garage is, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is first and then go into the research. Um, so this is where I work, and it's a company um, down in Menlo Park. Um, we have an awesome kitchen, we have lots of robots running around, and I like to think of it as sort of um, this play space where we try out this possible future of having robots all over the place and seeing what actually happens when people encounter them and are around and with them and having to deal with them. Um, so in case you're unfamiliar with where Menlo Park is, Berkeley's up here, Willow Garage is down there, we're next to that other university that starts with S. I know I'm a traitor, I'm sorry, I still cheer for the bears. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, some of you may have seen this before, probably in Peter Abiel's lab. This is the PR2, stands for Personal Robot 2, um, and it's what we build at Willow Garage. This is developed as a platform, a research platform, for people at universities and large companies to be experimenting and sharing their code, open sourcing their code, um, on a common base so that we can actually um, get things done by building on the shoulders of others, right? So if I'm a computer vision researcher, I don't need to know anything about manipulation um, and Jacobians and transform functions, right? I can just do my computer vision and take everybody else's code to make my robot do cool stuff, like fold towels. Um, so this is a 500-pound mobile manipulation platform. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying it's a robot that runs around and grabs stuff in human environments. The thing that's special about it is that it's designed to be safer than most robots, so they can be in human environments, right? So if you look at where robots are right now, they tend to be used on the battlefield, um, and they're used in factories. In the US, it's usually behind big cages, and that's because these robots are so fast and so strong that they could literally knock your head off. Um, so the cages are there so that when a human enters the cage, the robot just stops. These robots are designed so you can push them around, which makes them, they're a little more compliant in their mechanical design. What's more important about Willow than the robots that we build is the community that surrounds us. It's not actually about the people in our building. It's about the people everywhere else. Um, and this is the set of universities who are part of the PR2 beta program. So these folks, um, we had a, more than 80 applications come in for PR2s. Um, and we were going to give them out to 10 universities, but we ended up with 11 because we just couldn't decide. Um, and there were so many great people there. Um, now the one at UPenn is at CMU, but this is sort of, this is where it all started. This is what matters. It's the people who are around the robots um, who are sharing their code with each other, who are talking with each other about what they're doing and inspiring each other. Um, it's not so much about the, the object itself. It's not even about the code itself. It's about the group of people that are there to help you when like, hey, your, your libraries don't really work. What's going on? How can we fix your API so that I can make use of your code to do something even bigger? Um, just for a sense of the people here, so this is PR1. Um, and it was made by Eric Berger and Keenan Weirbeck at Stanford um, in Ken Salisbury's lab. PR1 was made of wood. Even the gears are laser cut wood. Um, PR2 is many iterations beyond that. There's no wood in PR2. It's all metal and plastics. Um, and that's them at their original lab at Stanford. 
Um, since then, we've also built smaller robots like the TurtleBot, and those are more for entry-level robotics, right? So like high school kids can start programming now and not have to spend $400,000 on a big mold manipulation platform that they probably can't control anyway. Um, the software, so ROS, stands for Robot Operating System. And the goal of ROS was really to become the Linux of robotics, right? It's too early for us to be hiding all of our code and doing sort of trial by video. And, you know, it just so happens that my program ran once and I shot a YouTube video of it and now it's done. You know, navigation solved. Um, we actually want navigation to be solved by other people being able to take your code, put it on their robots, and really make it run. That's how you get the industry going. It's not by doing trial by video. Um, since we started doing this work, we've actually become more of an incubator. And we've spun out in the last two years a bunch of companies. Um, these are four of them. They're doing things like remote presence robots, um, industrial perception for looking, doing computer vision in 3D for important industrial applications, um, doing low cost manipulators, so hardware in arms, and doing application development on top of other people's robots. We have also spun out a bunch of nonprofit organizations that are doing things, these, I mean, you probably know OpenCV, um, the computer vision library, but also looking at, you know, 3D point cloud processing um, and doing things like ROS and simulators like Gazebo. So Willow Garage isn't really one thing. It's actually a whole conglomerate of organizations that are trying to get this personal robotics industry going. Um, now I'm going to jump into the science. So there's some interesting things that we can do when we've got an engineering science going on that's trying to start an in industry. One of those things is to build cool stuff. Uh, and this is what Michael Pogliani calls empirical technologies, things that we just build because we can build them. Um, and those actually inspire really new and interesting scientific questions. So that's actually my way of figuring out what's important to study next. Um, the other thing that we can do is a more academic style, right? Take some theory that we had that we think we could apply somewhere and use that to inform the design of the technologies. And of course, this is a nice feedback loop. Um, and this is the way that I tend to think about the work that we do. So we're both building technologies and trying to understand them so that when we build the next iteration of that tech, we know a little bit more about how it should be done. Um, I just want to mention, this is my team at Willow Garage. We don't have one picture of Doug because he just started. Um, we just stole him from Pixar Animation Studios. He's amazing um, and still lives in Berkeley if you guys ever want to talk with him. So my team is a bunch of researchers and designers um, of robotic systems. Most of Willow Garage consists of software engineers, um, the mechanical engineers, and the technicians who actually build the PR2s. So we're kind of the minority. We're the fuzzies in the building. Um, and I tend to think of robots as being something a little broader than just robotics. So when I talk about this, I'm talking about a bigger picture. Mark Weiser, um, back in the days at Park, talked about ubiquitous computing as b sort of pushing computing out into the environment. And this was in contrast to what was happening in those days in the late 80s of virtual reality, where we took a lot of objects and we tried to put them into a simulated world. Um, the contrast to that is this. What if we then took the computing, as you guys know in the Swarm Lab, and pushed it out? Right? What does that look like? What does that do to the people in the environment who are now faced with tons and tons of computational objects? Um, some people tell me that this object is just a tool. It's just a device. It's a piece of hardware. It's an engineered object. Um, but I would actually argue, and I'm going to argue through this whole talk, that they can be a lot more than that, and they can be a lot less. What I mean by a lot more is if your cell phone rang right now, it'd be a little bit embarrassing. Um, and that cell phone would be feeling like it's doing its own thing, right? It's acting against your will. At the same time, your cell phones can be a lot less. So when I talk with my mom, um, who's in Hawaii right now, I should feel like I'm just talking with my mom. I should not feel like I'm using an electromechanical device to send signals of my voice compressed over a network to her to form the illusion that she's hearing my voice through of her phone, right? It should just feel like I'm talking to my mom. It shouldn't matter what this device is at all. So I'm going to talk about you know, these, these two different phenomena that happen. And they're, sort of, they're psychological phenomena, but they're psychological phenomena that matter. And that should inform the design of technologies like robotics. So you know, when we think of human-robot interaction, people usually think of something like this. And this is a, a piece of artwork done by Jorge Cham, PhD Comics, for the grad school students out there. Um, but the other thing that I think robotics informs is the design of agentic objects. right? So things that don't look like robots but they're using robotic technology. They're being more agentic than they were originally designed to be. So when you go get cash from an ATM, you are forming a contract with a non-human being and getting cash out of your bank account. That's a real transaction that you're making with a non-human. 
Uh, also, your analog braking systems. If you have a modern car today, you probably have um, analog braking. And really, when you're hitting that brake in your car, you're just suggesting to the computer that the car might want to stop sometime soon. You are not stopping your car. Uh, you're mediated through a computer, um, and that matters. The other thing is that now we've got machine learning thermostats, right? So yes, you can set the temperature of room, but now the temperature can actually be anticipated based upon past information. And these things are getting more and more agentic, more and more smart. Um, and what does that mean for the design of the systems, and how are people going to make sense of that? Um, there are lots of other ro more robot robotic products out there, and I think this also informs the design of systems like these. Now, on the flip side, right, I talked about, you know, talking with my mom on the phone should just feel like talking with my mom. Um, and Heidegger talked about this. A lot of the theories that informed ubiquitous computing actually talked about this. So if I talk about the blind man's cane as being very ready at hand, right, so Terry Winograd used to say, you know, you could think about it as being very cold and hard and made of a particular type of wood. And that's you perceiving the blind man's cane as being sort of this object. It's very present at hand. But when you're actually using that blind man's cane, ideally it should feel ready at hand. You should be able to perceive the world through it. You shouldn't feel like you're using a cane to perceive the world. You should just perceive the world. A more everyday example is cars. Um, so James Gibson, who's more well known for talking about affordances of objects, has actually talked about some other crazy ideas that are really neat. And one of them was this idea of this sort of tongue of possible spaces that you could go into. So if I've got a fast sports car, my tongue of possible spaces is really long and really maneuverable. But if I, I've got an old jalopy, it's pretty short. And it's not so responsive. And so as you sort of become one with your car, you know what its abilities are. And you know what you can do on that road based on the car's properties. Uh, Scott McCloud, the graphic artist, talks a lot about other everyday examples of these, right? So we forgot what it's like to learn how to use chopsticks or how to use a fork and a knife, and yet we use them every day, and you just think of that as eating. But really, there was a point in time when that was very present at hand, and that was hard to do. You've got to take time to learn how to use these objects. So the way I'm going to structure this talk is a couple of stories about interacting with agentic objects, a couple of stories about interacting through these kinds of robotic things, um, and then a couple of examples where it gets really, really messy, uh, and they're doing both at the same time. All right, so let's get started. When we built the PR2s, um, we had a big argument about them. And you know, we'd spent a couple of years working on the development of them, and a lot of the guys in the room said, PR2s are awesome. We should tell everyone about how awesome they are. Uh, and I said, mm, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> uh, and you know, the best way to figure this out is to say, you know, that's an empirical question. Let's find out. How should we present these robots to people when we put them out in the world? And in sociology, you know, Irving Goffman talked about face work. The way that you present yourself as a person is different to different social spaces. So the way that I talk to my mom is different than the way that I talk to my friends, and that's different from the way that I talk to my colleagues. And that's okay, you're not lying. It's just that you have different faces to different people. Um, maybe robots should be presented differently to end users than they should be to roboticists. From cognitive psychology, uh, there's a bunch of things that could help us here too. So if I asked you what that middle symbol was, you'd probably say it's a B. And if I showed you this afterwards, mm, yeah, it's still a B. And that's because we have this cognitive bias to sort of believe the things that we believed in the first place. Um, we become sort of stuck and anchored to that. In <laughs> social psychology, uh, there's one more thing that also says, like, you should tell them it's awesome. Because if, say, Bjorn had you know, talked to you before this talk and said, Layla's a really boring speaker. You don't want to go to that talk. Um, there's actually empirical evidence that says, that you would learn less, you would pay less attention, and you would be bored. Um, on the flip side, if Bjorn had said, Leo's a really awesome speaker, you should really come see the Swarm Lab talk, um, you would pay more attention, you would learn more, and you would have more fun. So let's hope you heard good things about this talk <laughs> before you came here. Um, so all these like social science theories say, you should tell them it's awesome, right? But the business people say the opposite. The business folks say, you should always under-promise and over-deliver. So if I tell my boss, I'm going to get that project done by next week Friday, but I'm actually planning on getting it done earlier, that's an example of under-promising and over-delivering. And it's a good way to behave in a space. Of course, marketing doesn't work like this, right? So the actual way that robotic products are marketed is over-promising, right? So Ivo is not actually a partner. Ivo is a robot. Um, and Pleo doesn't really change his mind, right? He's programmed to behave this way, but this is the way that they're sold. And the question here is, 
does not matter. It doesn't matter how you present these to people before they actually interact with them. So in this experiment, we, gave, we put people in one of two conditions. Half of the people were told that this robot has many people sensing and interactive capabilities, and the other half of the people were randomly assigned to the condition where they were told this robot does not have many people sensing and interactive capabilities. So it's just a little teeny you know, framing switch. And then we let them interact with the robot. So again, half the people were told to have high expectations about this robot, half were given low, and we balance across robot type because we don't really care about the particular robot type, but we do want to know if it generalizes. So our hypothesis was that you know, if you tell people the robot's pretty cool, they're going to believe it's pretty cool. Um, and that turns out to be right. People think when they had high expectations that the robot would be better able to perceive people uh, and it would be able to sense touch. Here's the more interesting one. So the psych theories all say you should set expectations high. The business folks say you should set them low, right, and beat those expectations. And then the real question is who, who wins? Um, and the answer is the business folks. <laughs> Um, if you look at the ways that people perceive these robots, right? if I set low expectations, people actually think that robot is smarter after they've interacted with it. Remember, they're interacting with the exact same robot, the exact same algorithms and everything. And just because of that little framing at the beginning, um, they actually have a much more positive perception of that robot in the end when you set expectations low. Um, so the business people won. Yeah? So what is, that, what is the y-axis there? The y-axis is a one to seven scale. Um, where we told them that it's not competent at all up until very competent. Um, and these are means, and the bars are standard errors. Do you yeah. have understand it correctly on the basis of six people? This is, no, not six no. people. <laughs> six per cell. So 24 people okay. total. Yeah. Okay. So it's balanced by gender also. Um, the more interesting thing, I think, about these was some of the qualitative findings. So we looked at this interesting formation of false beliefs that happens with robots. And I'm going to just play this so you can hear it. Um, do you want this, please? Please? Oh, that's cool. It seems to understand leaf. It does not understand leaf. What about tree? Cookie? It doesn't understand tree or cookie either. Um, so because Pleo happened to make a sound and happened to move in that way, right when the, she said the word leaf, she started thinking, oh, maybe it is understanding what I'm saying, right? And she sort of tests that hypothesis. It's kind of neat. Um, this guy wanted to see if Iba would walk off the end of the table. Walk? Walk? And he was set with high expectations. Um, move? So he's going to push this robot. Nice. He stops the Move. robot. Wow, nice. So it does um, do navigation stuff. And it didn't do the navigation stuff, right? It, it can do some. Um, but this guy actually helped Ibo to perform better on the task because he kind of wanted it to be smarter, right? Um, so this is one last video. The first person was set with high expectations. They said, we have many interactive capabilities. The second person um, was set with low expectations. So she, she thought that it didn't have that many interactive capabilities. Um, let's see what happened. They also wanted to walk it off the end of the table. So the ear broke off and the leg broke off. <laughs> and I had to fix it because there was no more tech support. This one's more interesting. So she had low expectations, remember? She actually puts her hand below the edge of the table. I'm trying to make the other off the table. Yep, definitely can. So because she thought that it wasn't very capable, she was ready to catch it when it fell. And I was thankful for that because at this time, Agobi Labs was also going through some turmoil and they couldn't fix it for us. Um, and so, you know, I think the lesson from this study is don't want to overpromise because then when they actually use your robots, they're going to be sad. So what you should do is sort of set the bar a little bit lower than what you can do and then beat it. Um, and people's perceptions will be better of the robots. The other thing is that the expectation setting matters, and it doesn't only matter for perceptions. It also matters for the way that people behave and interact with these robots. All right, I'm going to go through the second study now. Um, PR2s were designed to open doors, run around buildings, not run into anything, um, and plug themselves in. So, you know, on, uh, for several months, the robot sat in the hallway looking like this. Thinking about opening the door, trying to perceive the door, um, 
seeing the 3D point cloud, trying to figure out where the door is in that space, and then find where the handle is, move up to that handle, eventually grasp the handle, and slowly open the door. So this is a hard technical problem. Um, my problem with this was that my office was over here, and the coffee machine was over there. So I, on, on a daily basis, maybe a few times a day, I would run in front of the robot because there was no other way, to, no other fast way to get to the coffee machine. Um, and every once in a while, pretty frequently, the software engineers who were working on this problem would be like, no, no, you messed up the point cloud. Don't run in front of the robot. Um, and I would tell them, you know, it looks the same when it's off as when it's thinking really hard. Um, and that's kind of annoying, right? Because I don't want to get in the robot's way, right? I actually want it to succeed. Um, and I don't want to get punched by the robot. So we <laughs> decided to turn to some people for help. Um, and the people that we turn to are folks who know the best how to make inanimate objects seem alive and to help us to be able to read them. And those are animators. So Doug Dooley, who at that time was a character animator at Pixar, um, helped us with showing, you know, this is what the robot does right now. It just sits there thinking, and a person comes up, but robot really doesn't care. And then eventually it just reaches for the handle. And that's, that's okay, right? That's, a, that's fine if you're just a functional machine. But if you want to be a personal robot, what if you could show <laughs> that you're thinking? Um, and acknowledge that people are coming up behind you and then grab for the handle, right? What does that do to the interaction between us and them? Does that make it better? And we actually tested that. The other thing that robots know is whether they've succeeded or failed, right? You give it a goal and it knows if it did it or not. He opened the door, he really doesn't care. Um, what if he opened the door and showed that he was kind of happy about it? Right, maybe that's a little bit better. <laughs> But of course, most of the time robots fail because they're doing really hard tasks. Um, and so maybe the door's locked, maybe he slips on the handle. Um, he failed and he doesn't care. But what if he did? Would that make a difference too? This is actually my favorite one. So robot didn't open the door, notices he didn't open the door, <laughs> and has some remorse. Um, I love that one. So what we really wanted to know was, okay, these are cute, but does it really matter? Um, so we put these online and had mechanical turkers go and look at them. And we asked them questions like, you know, could you describe what's happening in this scene? What would you do if you were in that situation? What do you think of this robot? Here's a bunch of adjectives. Give us some ratings. And we did this across four different domains. Um, one was delivering a drink to a person. One was opening the door, which you saw. Um, one is ushering people in a certain direction. And the last one is trying to get people to plug it in. Um, so, you know, we balance across people. This is 273 participants between subjects, so each person only saw one condition, not all of them. Um, and we wanted to know, you know, does showing forethought help? The sort of thinking about opening the door. And does showing reactions to your success or failure help? Um, they do make the robot seem more approachable and more appealing, and these are both goals that many animators have when they're doing their work with characters. Um, this is pretty cool, but the thing that was even better was this. So if the robot failed at opening the door, uh, people thought it wasn't so competent in comparison to when the robot succeeded at opening the door. Um, this is the best part. If you fail at opening the door, you should at least look like you feel bad about failing at opening that door because then you get a boost in perceived competence. Um, so it's not that, you know, robots shouldn't just emote for the sake of emoting, um, but if you emote in a goal-oriented way, um, you get a boost in the way that people perceive it as being smart. Right? So, you know, using these animation techniques, things that are not necessarily written in books, um, you can actually make things more functional and more readable to everyday people. Right? Those of us who aren't robot whispers, those of us who don't want to run to the command line to figure out what's going on in the robot's head. Um, and this is some of Doug's other work. <laughs> He's been hey, robot. on robot. Hello. What is your name? So this is My programmatically is designed behavior. Doug, correct? No, no, it's Doug. I'm sorry, Doug, correct? Yep, that's it. Hello, Doug. Robot, could you pick up this ball and put it on the floor? Certainly. Thinking really hard. Good job. Could you take me to the exhibit now? Certainly, follow me. Right, so the cool thing about this is that, you know, computer graphics and animation are already hard. Um, but those characters get to have an infinite number of degrees of freedom. 
when you build a real robot that's actually in the physical world, you need to work with the limitations of, you know, maybe 32 degrees of freedom. And that sounds like a lot to a roboticist, but to an animator, that's like nothing. Um, plus, you have to look at the limitations of your motors, right? So can you actually do that pop that fast? And so Doug has actually gotten enamored <laughs> by robots and the challenges that they present to expressivity and readability. Um, and so he's actually come over to Willow Garage full time to work with us on robot behavior, um, given whatever robots we've got. Um, of course, you know, we've done a lot of other work looking at other kinds of agentic objects. You might recognize that person over there in the top corner. Um, there's a lot of spaces where I think sort of thinking about these machines as not just machines, but as agentic objects can make a big difference. All right, so we talked a little bit about agentic objects. Now we're going to flip over to the other side, right? Talking with my mom on the phone should feel like just talking with my mom. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of a story so that I can tell you how we ended up in this space, because it was not on purpose. Um, this is my coworker, and his name is Dallas, and he looks like that box right there. <laughs> um, so for many, many months when I started at Willow, Dallas was just a voice in a box on a table. And that's okay. Uh, it's not great, because a lot of the ways that we make decisions are by arguing with each other and hashing it out, and then finally you know, coming to some kind of conclusion. But if we don't like what someone's saying on the phone, it's really easy to just hang up on them. Um, so you don't have a lot of agency. You don't have a lot of input uh, on these engineering decisions. So to try to take it another step further, we put Skype on a laptop on a cart. Many companies do this all over the place. And his buddy, Kurt, would push him around the office, take him to talks like this, right? And he'd sit on the side and say, like, hey, could you push me over a little more to the right? I can't read the whiteboard. Um, and that's a little bit disruptive. So being a robotics company, Dallas and Kurt literally over one weekend uh, built this. And Dallas came into work one day looking like that. So that's Dallas. He's driving that robot from Indiana. Um, the robot is actually physically present in our office in California. So he can do stuff like when you don't answer his emails, roll into your office and block the doorway until you do. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really awkward to hang up on someone when they're in a robot. Um, so these were... You know, we, we didn't plan on building this. This was actually a Skunk Works project. We weren't, we're supposed to be building PR2s, <laughs> but they stole body parts from PR2s to make this. And it was so useful for us just getting to know Dallas as a person and making our collaboration better um, that we built 25 more of them and started fielding them at different companies around the Bay Area. And the reason that we did this was because we wanted to know if these were useful just because we love robots or if they're useful because there's something else there. Is there other value that other people would find, people who aren't roboticists, um, in these systems. And of course, especially here, you guys know these have been around for a long time, right? Eric Paulus made these more than 10 years ago um, in the prop system, the personal roving presence. And the first one was a blimp head that moved around the space in the air. And those are all very cool. Um, so these technologies are not new at all. What is new is that the wireless networks are finally able to support them, right? So when Eric was running this prop around, it was hard to run on for more than 20 minutes before you just sort of die. Um, or saturate the entire network. But now that we've got more broadband wireless, you can do this video conferencing two ways, running all over a building. Um, and that's where the power is. I think because of that, those wireless capabilities, now we can have commercial products right, that are in this space, doing remote presence with robotics for real. And of course, other people do them in other ways. Um, this is a different aesthetic. right? So Ishiguro here made a robot that looks just like himself, and that's called Geminoid. And the idea is that that's his representation, his proxy somewhere else. And that's cool. Um, until someone else tries to drive your body, and that's weird. Um, and so <laughs> until these get cheaper, I, I'm not sure if this is the way that I would go. Um, but one way that they've abstracted away is to say, you know, this is Talanoid. It's like a baby. It's an abstract person, so anyone could log in. So that's a, a different style. Um, just a bit of vocabulary. When I talk about locals, I'm talking about the people who are physically local and present with the robotic system. When I talk about remote pilots or remote operators, I'm talking about the people who are remote. So that's Dallas, right, driving the robot around from somewhere else. Um, so we wanted to know what would happen, right, if we put these in normal spaces, spaces that are not filled with roboticists. And we put them in several companies um, around the area. Many of the pilots were located pretty much scattered throughout the world, but all of their robotic bodies were in the Bay Area here. The things that they did with them um, were mostly the same as what you do when you're talking with each other face to face. The thing that was really cool was where they use them and how they use them. So if you think of you know, these, these video conferencing systems and voice conferencing systems, they're usually used in a formal meeting room like this one. But if you look at where these remote presence systems are used, it's everywhere else, right? It's in the hallway. It's by the coffee machine. It's in the big shared workspace because they're used more for informal communication as opposed to formal. So when you're having that powwow right before the big meeting where you decide what you're going to say, 
that's when you can actually be involved. And that makes a, a difference to remote pilots. Bonnie Nardi has a nice framework for thinking about you know, how communication technologies are used in the workplace. And all of them actually apply here. I'm going to go through each one of these in turn. The first one is just showing up is showing your commitment to being part of the team, right? So you guys actually coming here in the rain, in the cold, up the stairs to Corey Hall shows that you're being committed to the Swarm Lab, right? Being there matters. Um, and same thing here. Mike Beltzner was uh, one of the directors for Firefox at the time. He lived and worked out of Toronto, but his team was in Mountain View. Um, and just by sort of bothering to show up, right, it actually communicated something to his team that mattered. The other thing that you can do is pounce on people. Uh, so I mentioned, you know, if you don't answer Dallas's email, he'll come chasing after you. Um, the good thing is that we can run faster than that thing rolls. So if you really don't want to answer the question, you could run away. It's kind of rude. Um, but you can both capture and keep attention, right? So there's a lot of times when we have people call into systems like this, and you forget that there's someone on the other end of that line. Um, here, it's really hard to forget because they're actually you're seeing them constantly through the interaction. And the last one sounds touchy feely, but it's really not. This one is probably the most powerful. Building social connections with your teammates, even if they're just work teammates, actually greases the wheels for making it easier to collaborate more effectively together as a team. So these robots don't have arms, so they can't play pool, but they can heckle the guys who are missing their shots on our playing pool. <laughs> um, and you know, building those kinds of bonds makes, it makes people sort of form relationships with each other that are more human um, and less like, oh, that's just my coworker, that's just an employee. So we do those field studies, right, to figure out you know, what's working well, what's not working well, what are the design variables that we could tweak and see if that actually makes a difference in the way that they're being used and the user experience, right? And so we run a bunch of controlled user studies to try to iterate upon that design. Based on that, we build a new system, field it, uh, and repeat. This has actually resulted in one of our spin-outs that's called Suitable Technologies. Um, they've rebranded it as the Beam, so you can beam into a meeting. Um, and this is our new user interface for driving them. So this is not at Willow Garage, this is at Suitable. Um, but you can drive around our office. Funny thing is when you're piloting them, you kind of forget what you look like over there. So we've installed a bunch of mirrors um, around the building so that you can get a sense of what you look like, too, on the other side. So this is what I look like, I guess, when I'm driving these robots. Um, we do tend to not call them robots because they're more just devices, right? You want to think of them as a communication technology as opposed to a robotic technology. These are straight up teleop. There's no autonomy at all. Um, and so you are always the one who's responsible for what's happening um, on the local end. You may have seen this before if you watch The Big Bang Theory. Um, that's Shellbot. It's actually Texai, which is our prototype. We have been accused of copying Shellbot. Um, and I just want to set that record straight. We invented that thing, and they asked us to use it in the show. So um, we did not steal from, from the Big Bang Theory. All right. Um, one example of the controlled user studies that we've done to figure out how to improve its design was this. What the real goal of these systems is, is to make people feel more like a team, even though they're at a distance. So we studied this idea of sort of in-groupiness. Um, and how can we make that better? In HCI, Human Computer Interaction, people like my old advisor from Stanford, Cliff Nass, did these cool studies where they said, okay, if I can make you feel more like a team with your computer, does that help? Um, and so what they would do is put a blue wristband on your wrist and put a little blue frame around your computer. And lo and behold, people were much nicer to that computer and spent more time trying to teach it, and you know, as opposed to when it's red and that's out group, that's not my team member. Um, so people do these funny things where we sort of translate sort of normal interpersonal psychology with HCI. Could we do that with robots too? So we let them de decorate the robots um, with the same color as their team, um, interact with someone through it, and then go through this protocol, right, where uh, you either decorate it or you're not given that option. That's the between subjects variable. You do a collaborative decision-making task together, and we look at how much you agree on that decision-making task. Um, and then we tell them, you know, you're going to be rated interdependently, meaning as a team, or independently, meaning all by yourself, on that task performance up there. Um, then we let them chit chat for a while. We kind of look at things like how much information do they disclose about themselves to the other person as a metric of in-groupiness, right? How much am I willing to say to this person? Um, and then a bunch of questionnaires. So again, this is a between subject experiment design. So each person only saw one condition. Um, and the visual framing was either they got to decorate the robot with their team color, or they didn't. And they were either told that their scoring would be interdependent or independent. So we figured, you know, people probably have more positive responses when you're told you're going to be scored as a team. And that turned out to be true. You disclose more information about yourself 
when you feel like you're a team, um, and you ascribe more human-like and fewer animal-like emotions to your team member. There's a really neat piece of literature in the in-group behavior, groupiness literature that shows that I attribute more primary kinds of emotions to people who are out group. So it's sort of animal-like, right? Happy, sad, angry. But if someone's an in-group member, I give them much more nuanced emotions, right? They might find, feel things like angst, um, and those are different. They also like the pilot more if they're part of their team. The more interesting part was this, right? So does it help when you decorate? just like it does with computers. And of course, because of what Cliff found in HCI, we figured, you know, people would be more positive in decorating. And the data blew up in our faces and went in the exact opposite direction. So what's happening here is when you decorate the robot, you want to cooperate with that person less. And you really don't feel like talking with them after the study is over. So what's going on here? Um, our current working hypothesis is this. Because we let the locals decorate these devices, they felt like that robot was theirs. And now there's a stranger logging into their robot and talking with them and disagreeing with them and arguing with them. Um, and so it actually backfires because now I feel like the robot's part of my team, but that person isn't. Um, so you've got this weird source orientation problem, right? So we think it might not be so good if locals decorate them, but if they decorated them with the remote pilots, right? Like if I'm driving around in the robotic body, um, and I sort of cooperate with my teammates in decorating that robot, then it could be a little bit more of a team object as opposed to like just mine. Um, what we learned from this really is that you can't always translate directly from HCI to HRI, right? from human computer interaction to human robot interaction, especially in the case of robotic telepresence. What that object is, is pretty complicated. Any questions on that one? All right, let's go to the messy stuff. So we talked about robots becoming invisible in use and agentic objects, um, and this is going to be a couple examples of both. Um, yes, it's confusing, yes, it's a mess, but this is where the really juicy stuff exists. Um, so we decided to you know, keep studying much longer term how people use the telepresence robots um, and to see where the breakdowns would happen and see if we could actually address them. So this is in more companies um, across more locations. And we did contextual inquiry observations, we did interviews, um, we did surveys, everything we could to figure out like what's going on here. And the kinds of breakdowns that we saw were these. Um, if you think of this system as being just like a telephone, then when you're done talking, you hang up. Um, and that seems like it would be all right, except for then the locals have a dead robot body sitting at their meeting table that they didn't have to put away in the charging station. And this doesn't scale well. Um, so Kurt, our guy, uh, our local, would often have to run around at the end of the day and put away all these dead bodies because people would just leave them around the hallways, and that's not nice. Um, so the locals would get upset. The other thing that happens is when you do a really good job with helping those remote people feel like they really are present, that's just me. I'm in California, even though I'm not. Um, they get upset when you hit their buttons. <laughs> so um, there's actually volume buttons over here, and many times people would be like, you're too loud, I'm going to turn you down. Um, and the pilots would get sort of upset about that because you're violating their personal space. Um, the other thing that happens is when you put big red buttons on robots, if you're in industrial robotics, you know that's just a run stop, right? And that's just a safety. But in a consumer space where no one's ever seen the big red button before, they hit it. And that disables the person. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Dallas actually uh, was working with one of our contractors. Um, and he logged into the robot that was at their site. And he went into the space that he wasn't supposed to go in because some other client's work was there. And so this woman came up to him and she was like, no, 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 you can't go over here. And she shut the door and then went back to her cubicle. Um, so he followed her back to her cubicle to ask her, you know, what did I do wrong? Like, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to bother you. Um, and she said, you're being disruptive and hit his run stop. So she purposefully <laughs> disabled him. Um, and then I got a phone call from him saying, like, can you talk to her, please? Because I don't really know what I did wrong. And that kind of hurt my feelings. Because it's, it's one thing, right, to be hung up on on its phone. It's a completely other thing to be shut off. Um, and there's actually no way for him to reconnect to that body afterwards. Um, so if there ever was such a thing as sort of like violence against robots like, and people, this might be it. Um, so we were like, well, what's going on here, right? I think there's some interesting work that actually started at Berkeley 
that can speak to this, right? So what are the metaphors that people are using for making sense of what's happening here, right? So in the communication sciences, they talk about, you know, when I read an article in the New York Times, I think of it as being the New York Times giving me information. But when Dan Rather is the one who's a face on a screen, I actually tend to think of it as being Dan Rather, not as CBS News. So there's sort of this, even though it's the exact same thing, my perception of that source is different based upon the media. Right, Cliff would say, Cliff Nass would say that these computers are social actors anyway. So of course you're going to perceive these robots as being agents. Bruno Latour, also the same thing, right? Everything's an agent. Even speed bumps and stop signs are agents, just the same way like the guy with the sign is an agent. Um, so of course, you know, these robots should all be agents too. Uh, George Lakoff, who is here, would be saying things that are, are very similar, right? But the problem with English and many languages is that they're ambiguous and we have multiple metaphors for making sense of things. So I'm going to try taking a poll right now. If I told you the next Wednesday's meeting was going to be moved forward two days, what day is that meeting? If you say Monday, could you raise your hand? Cool. If you say Friday? <coughs> nice. All right, so it's about a 50-50 split. Um, you're all right. <laughs> and the reason is this. There's actually two ways that Americans and P English speakers think of and talk about time. One is that I am... Time is moving, and it is moving by me, right? Like, I'm just waiting for the days to go by. Um, and so if you're in a Monday kind of mood, it's because you're feeling like time is moving by you, and you are stationary. If you're in a Friday kind of mood, this is a different metaphor. This is like, I am charging forward into the future, right? I am more agentic. I'm the one moving, and time is just sitting still, and I'm going this way. Um, and it turns out that at any given time, one person will shift back and forth between Mondays and Friday kinds of moods. Um, and that's just... That's just how we make sense of the world. So if you're ever going to change a meeting time, don't say it this way. Say the explicit dates. Um, because it is viable and true to answer both directions. Um, same thing with these robots, right? There's actually a bunch of metaphors that are all getting mixed up in here. Um, when people started studying media spaces, they talked about them as spaces, as windows into other spaces. Um, but when you start rolling around in your screen on wheels, it's not quite the same. So then we tend to talk about them as being more like proxies or avatars. And thanks to Hollywood now, more people know what avatars are, but that's still not a very visceral, normal thing that we experience every day. So when we look at how people behave around these telepresence robots, we see things like very human-oriented behavior sometimes. So they're giving personal space to these guys, just like they're giving personal space to each other. Um, sometimes we see them, you know, talking with each other just like normal, but then sometimes they get a little bit too close, <laughs> uh, and the pilots will get upset about that. Because the local feels like it's just a machine, so I can poke into your cameras, but the pilot feels like, that's my body, you shouldn't be touching me, right? Um, and of course, you can get very human-like behavior. So what's funny is, this is in California, and these are very friendly people, they're very nice, but they're not best friends. Um, and you, and as an employer at a California institution, you don't want to do that to your coworker because you might get sued. Um, but <laughs> because it's in a robot, it's kind of okay. Um, <laughs> then there's a lot of non-human-like metaphors, right? Like, I'm just going to call that Skype on wheels. That's just a machine. It's a robot. Um, I'm going to say things like, you need a mute button on that robot instead of John is being too loud and should shut up. That's a very different statement, right? So I'm blaming it on the robot. The other thing is we saw things at the ends of meetings where people would say, like, any questions? Any questions? Robot? No? Okay, let's move on. So like, <laughs> you, you, as a person driving these things, you take on the identity of robot, too. Um, and then finally, this looks like a normal interaction, too, until you look at his feet. Um, and he's actually resting his feet on the base of the, the machine. Um, and it's because of the physical design of the robot affords that, right? Like, it's a nice foot rest. Um, but if you think of it, if I'm thinking of it as the pilot is being like, that's my body, that's sort of like you're resting your feet on my knees um, or something, <laughs> and that's a little bit weird. So, you know, thinking of it as it can actually change and influence the way that we interact with each other through it. Um, Ideally, we want this, right? Ideally, you forget that it's a robot at all, and ideally, you just feel like that's just my friend, that's just my coworker, and I'm just talking with him. Um, but of course, it's never that simple. The most interesting metaphor that we saw was this, and this one I totally did not expect. If you think of it as a person, 
um, then you actually, many people start thinking of it as a person with disabilities. So it doesn't have arms. Why doesn't it have arms? Um, we saw locals helping the people who are driving these systems by doing things like, you know, you just need to turn left 40 degrees over here, or let me take a high-res picture of that whiteboard for you and email it to you so you can see it better, right? So they're assisting um, the remote person. One pilot was also saying, you know, when I drive around the office, sometimes I drop out of Wi-Fi zones, and then what I really want is a medical bracelet so I can tell people what to do when I die in the hallway. Um, and that actually is useful, because usually you just want a local person to push you forward a couple feet, and then you'll be fine. Um, so the lesson that we got here was this. It's okay that people are mixing metaphors. It's okay that we haven't figured out how to make sense of it. Um, but what really needs to happen is that the people at one site who are both local and remote need to agree on which metaphors you're going to use, right? So the trade-offs are this. If, I, if we're all going to decide that we're going to treat this as a human, um, then the pilots have more responsibility for their actions. Um, and, but they're also going to have pretty high expectations for their personal rights. Like, you, you should not hit that volume button. You should just tell them, shush. Um, the other side of that is you could agree that, you know, no, we're just going to treat this with non-human metaphors. It's just an object. Um, the issue with that is that then pilots start racing around the building because it's fun and they treat it like a car. Um, but they also have fewer expectations about their personal rights, right? They don't mind if you're sort of poking in their space. Um, so it's the shared metaphors that matter. It's okay if you just pick one or the other. Maybe we're going to form different social norms around them. I bet that we will over time. Um, but what really matters is that as a community of practice, you sort of, sort of glom onto the same direction so that pilots don't feel offended um, and locals don't get so upset. All right, last messy situation is this. Um, there's a lot of people who try to drive these and they just fail, right? Um, they log into the robot and they try to drive around and they just keep slamming into stuff um, in the office because it's, it's hard to learn to drive. It actually takes many years to learn how to drive a car and that's a very structured environment. If you're trying to drive a robotic body around a space that's cluttered like this, it's difficult. Um, so what we did was we added some autonomous assistance, right? So just straight up normal robotics. Um, you put a, a LiDAR at the bottom and you start detecting obstacles in the space. And if a person starts to try to drive into, say, a wall, you can replan their path so that they kind of go around it a little bit. So you're still letting them reach their goal position, um, but you're helping them do it without hitting things, especially people. Um, and this is similar to the way the Google car works. So we wanted to see what would happen if we added this assistance. So we gave people an obstacle course. This is a bird's eye view of that course. And we had them drive around a pretty cluttered office space that had trash cans, tables, chairs, walls, just to see how fast they could get through it and how many things they would hit. Uh, so people are either given robotic assistance to not hit obstacles or no assistance at all, which is normal right now. Um, and we measured one more thing because we thought it might matter. If you look at personality psychology, there's this notion of locus of control. And if I have a very strong internal locus of control, then I believe that I am in control of my destiny. If I succeed, it's because of me. If I fail, it's all my fault. If I have a very strong external locus of control, that means the things are just going to happen. The future is just there, and we're going to get there, and you know, just things will be as they will be. Um, and people who have a strong internal locus of control might have some trouble with getting overridden by robotic assistance. So we figured, you know, people are going to hit fewer obstacles and hopefully drive better when they have assistance. Turns out that they do hit fewer obstacles because we don't let them. Um, but it, it takes them a lot longer to get through that obstacle course. And then the data I'm going to show you next will start to figure out why. Um, we figured that people with the internal locus of control, right, I am in control of my destiny, are going to fight the system a little bit. And they do. It takes them longer to get through the obstacle course, right? Because they're trying to sort of finagle their way through the course in ways that the robot doesn't want to do. Um, and this is the most revealing one. So it's these folks here who take the longest time to get through that course. And it's because if I believe that I need to be in control, right? I drive a stick shift. Um, I don't want autonomous assistance. I want to be the one who decides. Like, I choose to hit that trash can. Um, and I don't want to be told that I can't. And so. We think that you know, if you measure things like these personality dimensions of people who are operating these robots, you can actually sort of tweak the design, the user interface design um, of these kinds of systems so that you can sort of match their personalities better. Um, you might just want a manual override um, just in case, right? The one that's available. Yeah, Carlo. Was the assistance popular? And you can clear it. I mean, the assistance was so bad. Yeah. We use pretty vanilla styles of um, <laughs> assistance. 
because we didn't want to get too fancy, but I do think that we could have done better if we had used newer algorithms. Like Microsoft Word, it tries to have more Yeah, tries. Faster. Right. <laughs> right. I think you could optimize it so that you get these down um, a little bit for sure. The thing that for me that was really cool here was this idea of even though I'm operating a robot, I need to feel like I'm the one in control. Um, and that's actually played out a lot in a different space that we've been working in. So there's a guy here, this is Henry Evans, um, and we've actually been working with him on a very similar project to this. So Henry saw our PR2 on CNN, um, and that's with Charlie Kemp at Georgia Tech. And he then calls up Willow Garage, which is us, and said, like, I want to use your robot as my body. He had a brainstem stroke 11 years ago that left him both paraplegic and mute. Um, so he hasn't been able to move around by himself. But this is actually him using his head tracker to operate a graphical user interface to scratch an itch, which was his number one task. Um, because it turns out, I mean, we don't notice it every day but because we can just do this. Um, but your face gets itchy maybe about 50 times a day. And when you have to wait for someone to come over to scratch that itch for you, it's hard and it's frustrating. Um, and so he also has been doing things like shaving um, with an electric razor. Um, because yes, his wife Jane can shave him, and she does every day, but he wants it done his way, <laughs> which is much closer. Um, and so we actually have a force torque sensor here to make sure that he's not pushing too hard. Um, and if he does push too hard, the robot's arm pulls back. Um, so the, the thing that's cool here is you can add autonomous assistance, right, to make it a little bit easier, to say things like just open the drawer, as opposed to having to directly teleop it like with a joystick. Um, but what we have to be very, very careful about is that we don't add so much autonomous assistance that Henry starts feeling like we're just doing it for him, right? Because he's already got people who are caregivers and his wife and his family who are taking care of him. Um, but what he really needs is to feel like he's doing it for himself, right? Having that dignity, having that independence um, is the real goal here. The real goal is not having autonomous robots running around as caregivers. The goal is to help him do it for himself. Um, I do want to mention one last project that's also in a very messy space here. So this is Maya, who just graduated from Georgia Tech and is on the job market right now. Um, she's been doing some really interesting work with programming by demonstration. So with Henry, right, he's operating it from behind the robot. He's using these controls. With Maya's work, she's actually taking this to a different level, right? So as an end user, if I bought a robot from my house and it needs to deal with my dishes and my cupboards, I can now program that robot by demonstration to get it to work with my specific space and fold towels in my specific way. Um, and so this is actually doing retargeting based upon object recognition. So it's not just sort of dumbly doing X, Y, Z. It's actually figuring out where the objects are and doing manipulations relative to those objects. The other thing that you can do is if you give it a demonstration that's not perfect, which most of us do, um, you can then edit these waypoints um, to make it do it the way that you meant to teach it to do it. And so these are sort of different interfaces for helping people to do, achieve things through the robots. It's very cool stuff. Um, so right, we went through this really messy space. I just want to recap before we switch to questions and answers. Um, we did a couple of studies, right, that we're looking at robots as agentic objects. A couple of studies where we looked at, you know, interacting through robots just as proxies. Um, and then the messy stuff at the end. And those were looking at, you know, how do we set expectations about robots so that people will have better experiences with them? And those are very agentic. How do we do, make them more readable? How do I know that it's trying to open that door, right? Um, before it actually opens that door. And what does that do to our interaction? Um, for the pilots of these systems, the operators of these systems, you really want it to feel like they're just there and they're just moving around. They shouldn't have to feel like I'm using this little joystick to do stuff. Um, but for the people who are local to those systems, they're experiencing it as a very agentic thing, right? There's a big thing rolling around their space, um, and that's, that's in a whole different domain. So, right, with the messy stuff comes in when you start mixing metaphors, right? Is this a human? Is this a robot? Is it something in between? Is it both at the same time? And then with assisted teleoperation, right, there's times when it's going to push against you. Um, and maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, right? So some people have talked about, this is just anecdotal, if you look at Boeing versus Airbus, Right, many airplanes fly themselves, um, and Boeing says when you get into a really tough situation, the pilot should take over, the human should take over. Airbus says when you get into a really tough situation, the plane should take over, um, and that's a decision, a very important design decision that we need to be able to figure out. Right, when you're who's really in control, especially when it really gets scary and matters. I do want to mention I did not do this work by myself. Um, these are many of the collaborators that I've worked with on the studies that I showed you. 
If you're interested in seeing any of those papers or getting introduced to any of these folks, I'd be happy to make those connections. Um, and it's not just at Willow Garage, right? Like we're doing it with a lot of collaborators um, in spaces, basically mostly around in, in this country. And right now we're starting to take on some new projects that are sponsored by the National Science Foundation um, with other universities, looking at things, you know, like how can these social personal robots be used to help kids to figure out, you know, what's good food versus bad food for my health? Or to learn English as a second language, right? What are the other application spaces for these systems? This is just a visual summary, and with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Well, thank you very much for a really interesting talk. I'm glad you mentioned the Boeing Airbus thing, because I was <clears throat> thinking about that in the back of my mind, but I figured that was too piloty geeky to ask. No. <laughs> it's <laughs> but interesting. But it, it would be really interesting of pilots that are training in simulators for those airplanes, yeah. what the different perceptions as they go through emergency maneuvers. Right, right. It would be really interesting to see how they felt about flying that aircraft. Yeah, I think that would be a really fun ethnography to do. So, enough pilot stuff. Questions? In that chart where you showed with assistance and without assistance, mm. why is it that with assistance it things get the completion time gets longer, no matter who you're dealing with? Right, it does take a long time. So, I mean, the, what kind of assistance did you specifically provide? That was oh, just that was, laser rangefinder thing. We we gave them lidar, and then it would redo the path planning. So if I tried to hit an op, uh, if I tried to drive from here right into the table, it would then replan the path. So it would kind of go around. Yeah, so um, you would think that you learn much faster that way. You would think so. Yeah. Uh, not everybody does, <laughs> though, because people are very. So, sort how, of I mean, how does how do people operate these things remotely? Does it a joystick, or what's the user interface at the other end? At there's the three. Level? There's three UIs. One of them is um, using the keyboard controls. Another one is using a mouse and dragging in a certain direction on the GUI, and the third one is using an Xbox controller. So, in that particular study, they are using the GUI with the mouse. So, point and click. I see. Yeah. Within a particular group that we're familiar with, we get a lot of information from just the body language. Mm. We see the intention, we see the person want to get up or wants to open a door and the like. Yeah. And obviously you try very hard on those robots to give a, a little bit yeah. of um, uh, this kind of body language. So the question is, at what point do we actually have to try to get some consensus of what the right body language is for a robot, so you don't have to relearn completely from scratch with every new robot that you encounter. Yeah. Is there some kind of a group that comes together and tries to set some, some standard or some, some common behavior that will eventually lead to uh, an easier understanding of the intentions of robots as they just about go to, to perform a particular action? I think, so there are some things that are basic, right, that are cross-cultural. So this tends to be an approach and this tends to be avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, this tends to be confidence and this tends to be lack of confidence. So Doug has been doing a lot of work exploring those dimensions. Um, but when you get more nuanced, right, like it's confused um, or even saying yes, right, in India versus the U.S. will look very different. Um, and so I, there are some things that I think we could automate and do systematically, everyone the same way, mm -hmm. kind of like leaning in, leaning out. But there's a lot of other stuff where I think it actually makes more sense to collaborate um, with the animators rather than try to, to automate what they're doing. So many of the things you mentioned are actually emulating the behavior of a real physical human body. Mm. And to the degree that the robot has the same elements like a, like a head and a torso and so mm -hmm. you can emulate mm -hmm. those. But other robots in the future may be quite different. Yes, yes. And uh, instead they may have a lot of lights. Yeah. So what can we do with those lights and with all the that other potential a... limbs or extensions that we don't have on humans? Right? I think that'd be a really fun design space and it's huge right now, especially because LEDs are getting so much easier yeah. and cheaper to control. Um, there's also the Pico projectors, right? Like could I put a little thought bubble above its head? <laughs> um, so I just think, I don't know, it's a really fun playful space that we could do a lot of good damage in as interaction designers. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I think it's really fruitful, right? There's a lot of folks who are working in HCI on you know, iPad apps, and that's, that's cool. Um, but I really think the robots need more help um, than the iPad apps do. So I would encourage those of you all in this room who are in that space to think about robotics as another potential domain to apply the stuff that, that we're learning. The other model we've seen very often is uh, dogs, right? So Pet dogs are pretty common, and we know how to read their, their body language, right? They don't speak English, and that's fine. Um, but you can tell when the dog's happy. So actually, at this, this last Human-Robot Interaction Conference this year, there was one video that was really cute where they stuck a, um, a dog tail on a Roomba. <laughs> 
and then ask people to interpret its behavior. There's also folks who are doing things like taking from drama and from stage performance, right? Laban theory and choreography. There's there's known dimensions of ways that people move on stage that you could actually use for things like even flying quadcopters. Um, so there's a lot of there's this neat space of like what is your body type and your kinematics, and then how do you translate that into readable motion? Um, it's going to be critical, I think, for the safety um, and for the interactivity with these systems. Great. Other questions? More discussion? John, uh, John, you know, we got a. John. We, we bought one of those Batafold, or a few of those, and we played with it a little bit. And the, the <clears throat> one thing that became obvious well, there were a couple things that happened. One was it was kind of like having a baby in the room, everybody was. <laughs> Watching yeah. it and afraid it was going to fall off the table, and it kept running into yeah. things and, and all that. But yeah. maybe that's just the startup stuff. But it seemed like there's a basic uh, limitation in that it's so slow that mm -hmm. you know, as people, we kind of turn. You hear a sound and you turn your head, right? Yeah. And none of these telepresence robots that I've seen are fast enough that you can actually have that sort of uh, right. thing. So I don't know if you've noticed that in your studies, uh, and and yeah. also an obvious thing to me seems like since this is it's a it's uh, it's at a handicap already, so maybe you could help it by putting cameras 360 degrees, so mm -hmm. you could see all the way around. So mm -hmm. that might be a way to help the problem. Yeah. Um, so there's a few thoughts there. One is yes, they move too slow. Um, the the number one problem that older adults had when operating these was they said it's really awkward saying goodbye to someone because you say okay, it was really nice talking to you. Now I'm going to slowly back out. Oh, and try to get through the doorway. Oh, see you later. <laughs> right. And it's just this terrible interaction because it's so slow and awkward um, and so I think if we wanted to add autonomous assistance we're like just go back to the dock that might make it a little bit less painful um, the other thing is you know referring to the way that you have awareness um, in the other space right we did think about putting 360 cameras on um, at this moment in time we decide against it because we have a sort of design rule which is like if I see you you see me um, because it gets really creepy when th they can do more than us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it feels a little bit unfair. Um, and you don't want it to feel like a spy bot, right? Um, and so for now, that's, that's been the design decision, but we have been thinking about making better awareness. Like one of those things we've been doing um, is looking at, if you put fake ears around two mics, um, the sound bounces off of those ears the same way that they bounce off of my ears. And so then you get sort of auditory spatial awareness that's more similar to human spatial awareness than just with the one mic stuck right here, <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Um, and so if we can increase their sort of situational awareness without cheating, um, that would be the ideal. Also, when they move fast, they can whack people hard. So there's, there's that trade-off, right? Like being really fast and responsive versus being able to smack someone by accident and try not to hurt them too badly. Can, do we have time? Can I ask one more? So the, I've always had a, <clears throat> this wondered about this for remote presence. The other way, <clears throat> the other model would be that uh, more like um, if I'm the pilot, rather than uh, seeing exactly what the robot sees, I see an overview of the space yeah, and yeah. with an avatar for myself in that space. So yes. is, uh, that is, there, is that an effective model? And people kind of looked at the the two. Absolutely. Um, we haven't done that with the remote presence, but we have done that with PR2. So like when Henry's operating a PR2, he does get that, that point of view like behind the robot's body mm -hmm. um, because it helps a lot, right? If we look at, actually the video game industry has figured it out. Right. And so we've mostly copied <laughs> many of their decisions. Um, and it turns out they're also the best robot operators. So if you wanted to Mechanical Turk, all these robotic services, that's where I would start is with the gamers mm -hmm. um, for first person shooters. So yeah, I think changing that perspective to be behind your head does help. It mm. makes you more effective. Right now, um, we sort of stripped out a lot of the autonomy and perception from the product version of it because that keeps costs down. Um, but for the research robots like PR2, it, it totally works. Mm. So I, it was kind of interesting. You started your talk by saying, well, with industrial robots, they have them in a cage because they can really hurt humans. And so then, you know, the robots you were talking about are sort of slower and less weaker. weaker and, you know, kind of, I guess, by contrast, they can't hurt humans. Mm -hmm. But it seems that at some point you're going to want 
the robots to be able to do something or help in some way that yeah. they couldn't otherwise. And so yeah. how do you make that transition to something which could actually really hurt somebody but doesn't? Yeah. It's like three laws of robotics or something. Right, that comes right. To well, yeah. <laughs> that was his sci-fi, <laughs> not his science. But um, there are a lot of folks looking at, like, how do you have really capable robots that are strong around people? So... Um, at DLR in Germany, they're doing really interesting work in that space. Osama Khatib's doing a lot of work in safe, capable robotics. Um, they rely upon really nice sensors. Um, and that's okay when you're in a very expensive space like you know factories, but it's a little different in the everyday world. I think we're, we're working towards that trade-off and figuring out where it would be. Um, for personal robots in particular, there's a big issue that has nothing to do with technology, which is um, legal issues. Um, so one of the reasons to not put autonomy in these systems is that then if the remote operator decides to drive their body off the edge of the stairwell, it's their fault because we know that they drove it. But if you gave them you know, obstacle avoidance and it didn't work and then they drove off the end of the stairs into the stairwell, um, it's kind of your fault, right? And in the automotive industry and in the airline industry, they're already covered with a special set of laws that are just for them. But with these, you know, trash can things running around in an <laughs> office, there's no special laws for that. Um, and so we have to be very careful at how we roll that out. Um, if any of you are interested in those issues, actually, we're doing a, a conference next week at Stanford um, on robotics and law that's being read, le led by Ryan Kahlo. So it's a lot of people in the legal community who are interested in robotics because, you know, the Internet kind of caught them by surprise, and they don't want robotics to do the same thing. So we're starting to work out those issues now especially if you're doing, say, I don't know, open source code, and all these people are using your code because it's BSD licensed, what if they hurt someone with it, right? Like, is that your responsibility or not? What if your machine algorithm, machine learning algorithm helps someone to hurt someone else? Is that your fault? Uh, we don't know. So the liability issues are huge here. I'm also happy to hang around afterwards if anyone has like you know questions you want to just talk about face to face one on one. Let's do one last question, then we'll do that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, oh. As we rethink what the role of machines are mm. in the human space, um, does that change what roles uh, f physically embodied humans have with yeah. each other in the space now that robots have sort of taken care of a certain part of it or uh, avatars for, uh, that are Kelly operated. I think so. Um, the the most the clearest work that I've seen in that space was Thomas Sheridan back at MIT, um, and one of his students, who the interaction folks here knows, Bill Verplank, was a student, and they talk a lot about um, automation. It's I mean, in factory automation, right? That already put some people out of jobs, changed the type of jobs that they do, and so he writes a lot about what. Then you're defining like what is dignified human work. Right? What are the things that we should not touch? Um, there's a big debate now about, you know, people say, we have an aging population. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? There's not enough young people to take care of them. I know, will our robots take care of our older adults? And um, that is a huge ethical issue. Um, and I think we do need to have discussions about, like, what are, where are the spaces that are okay to go? Where do we actually want robotics to be, right? Like, robots don't invent themselves. People invent them. And we get to decide, like, which way we invent them and in what spaces we want to apply them. So we do have control. I think, um, over the direction that we take, right? So we, at, at least at Willow, we purposefully stay away from things that we feel like are getting anywhere near that dignified human work um, and go more to other spaces where, you know, you can remotely have someone log in and do the work as opposed to robot takes over the job fully autonomously. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky question and a really important one and one that I don't think anyone's worked out just yet. But Sheridan started and Bill Replank's carrying on. Okay, well, thank you again. Thanks. Thanks for coming.